This week on the Computer Chronicles, the new Max. We'll show you the stunning new iMac and tell you what it can do. We'll look at a real screamer, the new Power Mac G3. The new Apple is about more than just hardware. We'll demo the newest version of the Macintosh OS. We'll demonstrate some stunning special effects software that really takes advantage of the Macintosh platform. You'll get to hear directly from Steve Jobs about where Apple is headed, and we'll talk to some Apple experts and analysts about the future of Apple Computer. Plus, my pick of the week, a nifty new graphics program for website designers. It's all coming up next on The Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Cybersmith, wired for fun and learning, with locations in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Palo Alto, California, and White Plains, New York. And by TechWeb, for up-to-the-minute technology news. Hi, and welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee. Well, they were about to start putting the nails into the coffin and bury Apple and the Macintosh, but a funny thing happened on the way to the funeral. Steve Jobs showed up, and suddenly there is new energy, new direction, new black ink, and a stunning new product, the iMac. So is Apple back? Is the iMac worth buying? We're going to find out right now. This is Dave Reynolds, editor of Mac Attic Magazine. Welcome, Dave. Thank you. And uh, we've got a gorgeous iMac sitting right here. Why don't we start with a kind of physical tour, since right. that's one of the big selling features that it kind of looks so cool, right? Absolutely. You know, got the, the blue and white case. CD-ROM drive up front, uh, there we go. speakers, jacks, power cord, the whole bit. Uh, All right, so let's rotate it a bit. It is heavy. It is heavy. 40, Turn it around. 45 pounds. And like that's the whole port business, that's right? That's the whole port business. There are no other ports. If you uh, bring it around to the back, there's uh, nothing but uh, Ethernet and uh, uh, modem port and a couple so other mouse, things. keyboard, modem, network. All in through the USB. All right, so why don't we put the uh, keyboard and the mouse in so we can actually all use right. this baby. We'll and normally ahead. you'd put the phone jack in there if you're going to go live right. on the internet. Right, and that's about all you'd plug in at that point. Yeah. And so. that's it, huh? And that's it. And if we turn it around, just to make the point you made before, I mean, there's nothing in the back. Nothing in the back. No ports. No ports. Clearly no not a PC. Absolutely not. Plug. And, and not a Mac plug either. It's yeah, uh, really. different for both. All right, so let's put it back up here. All right. And if you can grab the cables there. Sure. And iMac just turned itself on. Let's point out, uh, again, very cool industrial design keyboard here. Little weird looking yo-yo yeah, mouse there. Yeah, it's, it's completely round. It's got these little uh, things on the side. And uh, it, it feels odd in the hand, but it, it looks great. So. All right, so let's get going. One of the big features on iMac, supposedly, Dave, is uh, an idiot, never used a computer for it, take it out of the box, 10 minutes, and you're up on the internet. Absolutely. How do you do that? The internet assistant, setup assistant comes up and asks you, do you want to start, get on the internet? Mm -hmm. You say, yes. Uh, do you already have an account? We'll say no. We'll assume no. We're new. And then okay. Earthlink the comes on, tells you how to do this. Earthlink needs to know. So somebody Earthlink. guides me through the whole bit. It takes me to Earthlink as my default Earthlink. ISP. Exactly. You can enter your own if you have one already, but okay. Earthlink is there, one click. Go, I'm ready to go online. Exactly. Comes with a browser, I assume. Yes, and you can assume that it's an Internet Explorer. The All right, the, the investor gets his money back. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, and the iMac is, I mean, the i stands for Internet. That's, right. that's one of the things that it does well. So, uh, so there we are uh, on the web, and we've, your we've, web page. Exactly. We've downloaded this earlier. We're not live now, right. but uh, you would have a normal. But one. it is very fast. Yes. I mean, it's fair to point out about yes. the, the iMac. 56K modem, so, you know, on parity. Real fine kind of screen. You know. Great screen. Uh, high resolution, high uh, refresh rate, so it looks crisp. It's a, it's a nice, uh, nice display. All right. One nice thing about the iMac, it has USB ports. Explain yeah. why that's important. USB is important because the, uh, the Macintosh is going to get all the peripherals. Of the so it's a new standard for peripherals. Yes. Doesn't matter now whether you have a PC or PC Mac. or Mac. All you need is the Mac driver, the software, and that's real easy for companies to do. Now, if I want to go out and buy a Mac, there are still other Macs out oh, there. Yeah. What's the point in buying an iMac? It's not the cheapest thing in the world no. versus the regular desktop Mac that has all the ports and has the slots and all that. If your first time, the iMac is great. It's it's not complicated. You plug it in. But if you want some expandability, if you want to put in, say, a high-end graphics card right. or something like that. You should go for the desktop model. It's only about 100 bucks more. It doesn't right. come with a monitor, yeah. but uh, mm. you get some more expandability. So this is really yeah. the simple first-time user Exactly. Thing, which it really is kind of the old NC concept, right? It's sort of yeah. a network computer in yeah. a fancy box. And funny enough, it has 100 base T Ethernet wow. built in, which is kind of odd for a computer without a floppy. Now, the big wrap on the iMac, no floppy drive right. anywhere, and most of us are still moving information on floppies. Is that a big drawback, Dave? Not a huge one if you're willing to spend a little more money. There are floppy drives you can buy. You that can buy an external yes. floppy. Yes, plug it into the USB port and, yeah. you're, and you're off. But okay. it's, it's a little more money. All right, Dave, thank you very much. You're very welcome. All right, of course, the man behind the iMac and the newly rejuvenated Apple is the same guy who was behind the old original Apple, Steve Jobs. We caught up with Steve at the recent Seabolt conference in San Francisco. And the first thing I, I thought I'd do is give you an update. 
because I know a lot of you... When Steve Jobs walked on stage at the Seabold Expo in San Francisco, he wasted no time in marking the company's turnaround in 1998. Um, the first thing is, I, I had the privilege of speaking at Seabold uh, fall a year ago, and, and boy, what a difference a year makes. <laughs> it's, it's been a great year. And uh, we're not quite, quite done with our fiscal year yet, but we've had three quarters, and we've managed to go from losing a billion dollars the year before to uh, actually making over $200 million during the first uh, three quarters. His report on the company's improved fiscal health was no doubt welcome news to Macintosh fans, but the most important news revolved around the latest additions to the Mac line. And the first one, of course, was the Desktop Pro introduced last November, the Power Mac G3, and it's an awesome product, and we've done very well with it. Matter of fact, we just sold over a millionth G3 uh, since November. The Apple CEO announced that the popular PowerBook G3 would have a standard 14-inch LCD screen and a price drop to $2,800. He also reported on the sales success of the iMac. We have had a phenomenal response to this product. We've not been able to keep up with demand. We're shipping tens of thousands a week in and they're being sold like that. We just announced in Japan this last Saturday, and uh, it went very well, uh, except that we're sold out for the quarter already. And we are announcing in Europe over the next two weekends, depending on which country. So we're, we're seeing a phenomenal response to iMac. But the Apple news at Seabold was not only about hardware. Apple's co-founder gave a preview of the Mac operating system's long-awaited upgrades, including some of the new features in version 8.5 due out in October. Mac OS 8.5 is a must-have upgrade. And I want to go through, there's a lot in this thing, it's a lot more stable, dramatically higher performance in some areas, but I, I don't have time to show you all of it. I have time to show you four reasons why it's a must-have upgrade. The first one is Sherlock. The second one is file copying, the third one is color sync, and the fourth one is AppleScript. Sherlock is a kind of super search device that can sift through all major internet search engines at once. Sherlock's talents can also be applied to finding the same information on a local hard drive by name or content. Finally, Apple's OS X product manager gave a sneak preview of the future operating system and how it recovers from crashes. We'll have a bit of a countdown. When it reaches zero, it's going to start overriding low memory. It's going to start trying to crash applications. But I think Mac OS X is up to the challenge. Kaboom. Instead of crashing, we get an alert. The application bomb has unexpectedly quit. You do not need to restart your computer. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Sarah O'Brien. Apple has more going on these days than just the iMac. There's also the new Power Mac G3, which Apple says is the fastest personal computer in the world twice as fast as an Intel Pentium 2 PC. Here to show us the new G3 is Rob Capps, senior editor with Mac Attic Magazine. Welcome, Rob. Thanks. All right, the whole issue is speed, right? That's what right. everybody's saying about the G3. Can you show us an application that would demonstrate how fast this baby really is? Sure. Uh, this is Adobe Photoshop, and we have a 10... Steve Jobs, who's this guy? <laughs> the 10 megabyte image of Steve Jobs. Is this Jobs. the demo that comes with the G3? <laughs> this actually is publicity photo, okay. so we can show it around. And All right. And uh, you, a lot of Power Mac users use Photoshop. It's sure. a really common application, so it's also a really common one to test speed with. Here I'm just going to do a motion blur, which is just a blur that adds motion sure. to a photograph. And um, I do a 94 pixel blur. And as you can see, it takes a few seconds, but if you have worked with Photoshop on another computer, you will mm -hmm. know that this is extremely fast. Or let's compare it, say, working with a plain old Power Mac as opposed to a G3. A plain old Power Mac, one of the older 604s, you might see speeds up to twice as fast. Really? You might see a little bit less than that, um, you know, uh, three quarters as fast. Right. And how about the claim compared to an Intel 2 PC, a, a Pentium 2? Now, the, the Power Mac is not actually, this, in this case, is not actually, tw wouldn't be twice as fast as the Pentium okay. 2, since this is a real world application, you're not just right, testing right, the right, processor. Right. Um, it's actually probably a few seconds faster, maybe 25% faster than the Pentium okay. 2. But faster. 
faster. So is this mainly for a guy who's really working in graphics? Is that the advantage of the speed? Does it matter if I'm doing business type stuff? It helps for graphics. It helps if you work in business. As applications get bigger and more complex, you need more speed. It opens Word faster. It scrolls through documents right. faster. So it does everything faster. All right, Rob, one of the things I want you to do, if you can shut it down, and I want you to sort of take apart the box because the design of the G3 is kind of interesting and pretty sure. well done. So why don't we sort of knock it all apart. And let me get rid of the keyboard and the mouse here. And Okay, this is one of the really great things about um, there we the go. Power Max. Yeah, let's turn around this way if we can. I want to raise a little okay. bit so folks can see it better is they have a, a very easy to open case. If you ever open the PC, so you just pop that off. Little button and it has and green, you green handles that indicate where to flip the, flip the tabs. And there you have complete now that access is easy, isn't it? to the motherboard. All right, give us a little tour of what's inside here, Rob. Okay, over here this first card is a personality card that has your audio or video capabilities. Okay. Um, these are your three PCI slots. Right now we have an ultra SCSI and a video card in there. Right. These down here are your RAM slots. And this over here is the actual PowerPC Processor. Can we get in there and take a look at it? Is that possible? Sure. Let me just. It's not as big as a Pentium 2, is it? So that's the heat sink right there. Got no, it. it's much smaller and than Pentium 2. That is the G3. And this is a zero insertion force socket, so you can just pull the G3 up. Yeah, so it's kind of just and hold it nice it and steady. And let's take a look at it. So that's it. That's, that's it. And that's those two cool. black things right there are the backside cache that yeah. really add power to the G3. And when you want to upgrade it, you can just buy a new little right. card like that right. and put it into the new zero insertion force slot, and you're ready to go. All right. Uh, briefly, what's the cost for uh, Power Mac G3? They go anywhere from about $1,600 to about five grand. And the difference between those two ends is? Um, 266 megahertz all the way up to 333 megahertz. Um, this one, like I said, has an ultra SCSI card, two yeah. ultra SCSI discs. Uh, you can have video cards, FireWire, video, audio video personality okay. card, more RAM. Different Fast. configurations. <laughs> All right, Rob, thank you very much. The excitement at Apple these days has to do with more than just new hardware. There's finally a new version of the Macintosh operating system and an even newer upgrade coming out soon. Here to guide us through the new Mac OS is Jeff Pittlecow, Director of Labs at Macworld. Welcome, Jeff. Hi. Operating systems, not too sexy a subject in general. No, it's not. But there is some very cool stuff in, in the Mac OS 8, and actually 8.1, which is what you have up right now. Yes, this is the latest from Apple. All right, what, what's, what's, what would a user be interested in knowing about this? Well, there are a couple of things. Um, number one, they've added a new Mac OS Info Center, which really tells you everything you'd need to know about using your Macintosh and learning how to new use new features in the operating system. So we're system. sort of web-style help here yes. again? Yes, and it also has links to various Apple websites that can help you use the computer. Okay, so if you're not sure really what the point is in knowing about the OS, you can find out inside the mm -hmm. system itself. Now, now, you've got some other things that are, used to be shareware that you have to get on the outside that are in here too, right? Yeah, um, one of them is the ability to, uh, say you have a lot of windows on your desktop, uh -huh. you can collapse windows and still keep them around, but they don't take up a lot of space. Another one is that uh, you have the ability to set desktop patterns and pictures. Okay. So you wallpaper, can, huh? Yeah, wallpaper, essentially. Yeah. They provide a few samples, but you can get your own from a digital camera if you want. All right, so we just had a pretty picture instead of just looking at the smiley face of the Mac OS. Right. Wow, that is there cool. There you go. Okay. okay, so that comes built into the OS. You've mm -hmm. got some choices there. Uh, what else? And there's a lot of internet stuff now built into 8.1, right? Right. 8.1 includes Microsoft and Netscape web browsers as well as Claris Email or Lite. Okay. So you have all of the internet software you would need as well as some setup configuration assistance that help you configure everything that you need to get started. All right. So again, very net oriented, ready mm -hmm. to go on the internet, assuming anybody who's going to be using this is going to be using the internet at the same time. Right. Um, all right, now let's talk for a minute about the newest version, which is just about to come out, which is 8.5. What can you tell us about that? Well, that's due out any day now, and perhaps the biggest feature there, and it's really a departure from where Microsoft is going with integrating the Internet into the OS, yeah. is this technology called Sherlock. Which is what? Sherlock is a searching technology that's going to allow you to search the content of any document on your hard drive, as well as a number of search engines on the Internet. Huh, so it's sort of the same mentality, a search engine that looks at your hard drive or looks at some website or uh, the Internet somewhere and finds what you want regardless of where you may have put it. Right, and it'll collect all that information in a window for you and mm -hmm. rank it by relevance. 
Anything else in 8.5 that we ought to know? Much, much faster network performance. In fact, uh, our lab tests are showing it to be a little bit faster than Windows NT. Hmm. Wow. All right, last thing, this has nothing to do with the OS, but this is such a cool monitor that you brought here to show off the OS. What's the deal on this monitor? Well, this is called the Apple Studio Display. Yeah, flip it around. Let's it's, show it's a flat screen, very thin guy. It's about $1,200, and it's it really reflects the latest uh, industrial design that Apple is yeah, using with translucent right, plastics and everything's like that. So it's got a nice, easy-to-use stand. Tilts. Cables are all nicely mm -hmm. wrapped up there. It's even got a convenient place where you can put your keyboard if you want to get oh, it out so of the Oh, so little rubber pads desk. there. Yeah. Wow. And we say about $1,200. bucks. about $1,200. That is a gorgeous monitor. All right, thank you very much. New products, a new OS, a new burst of energy are all helping Mac fans feel a lot better about the future of the Macintosh, but what are the hard, cold realities as Apple tries to regain its market position and its financial health? We asked several experts, including the former chief technology officer at Apple and one of the nation's leading Apple analysts. When Apple Computer announced the iMac, Macintosh users and industry analysts around the world paid close attention, wondering if this newest expression of the Apple philosophy would bring the company back from the brink. Thankfully for Apple, the iMac was a hit, and now the talk has turned to wondering whether Apple could continue to prosper and maintain its independent ways. Ellen Hancock worked at Apple in 1996, after several years at IBM. There was something unique about Apple and the people at Apple, and I would describe it as an artistic touch. So these are, are technical people who also have an artistic bent in that I probably spent more time discussing color and fonts at Apple in the one year that I was there than, than in all the time I spent at IBM. Apple's original approach served it well in the 1980s, but the Mac's market share dropped in the 1990s, and the company fought hard to keep developers and loyal users on board. I think it's a battle with themselves. I think it's an execution battle. And I think um, that a lot of it has to do with the vision of Steve Jobs. And when that was there, it was a tremendous company. And when it was gone, it was not a tremendous company. Tim Draper still has plenty of Macs in his office, but he sees more work ahead for Apple to win back its loyal fans. The Apple company needs to continue to execute flawlessly, and I think they need to leap over the competition uh, in order to retain their users now, because they lost a lot of their software developers, they lost a lot of their users, and uh, the hardcores like me are still here. So Apple's been along this path before, um, but they were always doing that in a time when there was high growth possibilities in the market. The concern now and the difference now is that we're in a consolidating mature space. So it's important for Apple to reinvent themselves and reinvent the product they deliver to the market. Apple's decision to reverse its clone licensing caught many people by surprise, and there is still a general feeling that it was a mistake. I would have preferred they had not done that. Uh, I do understand that the clone business is a difficult business. I much prefer the course of saying, why don't we improve our own processes, improve our best, and at least our own market. We have the advantage that this is our technology. Uh, we have the advantage that we understand this market better than anybody else. So let's go back in and improve our processes. And so I regret that they did not do that. I think that was a horrible mistake. Um, and it, what it really showed was that Apple was unwilling to change its business model to accommodate other players. Um, and will they recover from that? I don't think they'll ever recover the market share that those guys would have provided to them. But in spite of Apple's past mistakes, some Silicon Valley insiders are cautiously optimistic about the company's future. If they can stay and have a presence, continue to roll out the Macintosh experience to the current Macintosh set, I think that's an accomplishment all by itself. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Sarah O'Brien. Despite all of Apple's problems, the Macintosh continues to be the platform of choice for lots of people working in creative fields such as animation, special effects, and 3D graphics. And one company that's really 
parlayed the power of the Mac into a dominant position as a Hollywood special effects software developer is Electric Image, and Jay Roth is Chief Technology Officer at Electric Image. Welcome, Jay. Thank you, Stuart. You guys have been working on the Mac, develop your software on the Mac, and just so we know what level we're talking about, I mean, give us the credits of some of the movies that have included stuff you've done on your software. Star Wars Special Edition, uh, Terminator 2, Mission Impossible, Spawn, The Mask, uh, pretty much any... This Hollywood is it. I mean, this is yet. the highest end stuff we see in the movies, right? Yeah, it's absolutely it's correct. Yep. All right, you've got a, a PowerBook G3 here, which is what we're using. Right. Uh, this is a software. Just give us a brief intro. We're not going to be able to figure this all out in a couple of minutes as to sure. how you would use Electric Image. Okay, well, we have different views into our world, and we basically move things around. That's what 3D animation is. Okay. The computer does all the other work for us. So upper so left window. Upper left window, we're looking at the top view of our universe, and I've just clicked and dragged down the camera. And you'll note that the view is now changing in the right view there. Okay. And this is actually the camera view. The, the gray area that you see here is the part that actually gets rendered. That's really what we would be seeing? That's correct. Okay. Uh, in the lower section here, we have what's called a function curve editor. And the function curve editor allows me to change some of the values mathematically instead of like clicking what? and dragging. So, for example, what we'll do now is uh, we'll actually make the spaceship roll a little bit more. We see it's somewhat rolling here. Well, we want to make that a little bit more severe, mm -hmm. a little bit more drastic. We just drag that curve down, and we see it's changed a little bit. I can check my motion by hitting the preview button, and we get a quick real-time preview. And, and there's that roll you just added into there. Absolutely. And we've substituted cubes in, in place right. of the spaceship for faster feedback. Okay. Now, let's take a look at some real stuff that you did. I know you have a couple of examples here of uh, animations that were created using your software on, on the Mac. Right. And what are you going to show us? Well, we'll show you uh, first uh, a quasar that was done by space artist Don Davis. And uh, what we have is effectively something that could reflect the creation of the universe, for oh. example. And uh, he started off as a traditional 2D artist, just mm -hmm. painting, and then graduated into 3D. And this All is right. the result. What else? Okay. We have the um, tire, uh, an example of some physics and particle systems interaction. And uh, basically, the animator was able to use a, a plugin for electric image called Real Motion to simulate mm -hmm. the tire hitting the ground, and then another plugin called Dante to do the uh, fire and smoke effects. All right, now people who do this stuff can appreciate how complex it really is, but people who don't may say, hey, what's the big deal, a tire bouncing? Explain why this is a lot of mathematics going on here. Well, it used to be on a computer graphics system, you'd have to hand animate the bounces and all that stuff. And, you know, physics, we can know how it really works right. in real life. So they've taken the physics math, applied it to a simple plugin, and you basically let the tire go, it rolls, and it and this is what would have happened in the real world. Absolutely. When you simulate it. All right, you've got a Mars rover animation to show us? Yes, uh, Mars rover. Um, this is, uh, again, by uh, Don Davis. And this shows us the little sojourner rolling off the uh, mothership. And oh. the uh, Mars landscape here is actually the landscape. They use the same data captured mm -hmm. from the mission and then just applied it in the animation. All right, finally, the Falcon Starship animation. Right, this is the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars, and this is what's called a QTVR, which is a, uh, an object movie. So what I can do is I can actually click, drag, and interact with it in real mm -hmm. time. And we see that this looks very realistic, and that's, again, uh, the same Falcon that we saw in the Star Wars Special Edition film, which we provided to uh -huh. uh, Industrial Light Magic. All right, real quick, rendering. People always hear rendering takes days and days to do stuff, and you want to do that faster. For people who don't understand, what does that mean, and why does it take so long to render something? Well, rendering is effectively painting each frame. Uh, the computer does all the work for you. Mm -hmm. It used to be in traditional animation, you'd have to do it yourself or use physical models and move them a little bit at a time. Yeah. Well, now the computer can do all that for you. And of course, if you have the world's fastest render, which like is what electric image. image, yes, absolutely. And speed counts. Speed counts, as does quality. Jay, thank you. Thanks. All right, that's our look at the new Max. I'll be back in just a moment with my pick of the week. Now for my pick of the week. When Adobe Photoshop first came out many years ago, it was really a revolution in how to create print graphics using a computer. But now a company called NetStudio Corporation has introduced another revolutionary product that makes it easy to create great internet graphics on a PC. Web graphics are different from print graphics. On the web, you need to work within the limits of the internet and bandwidth. You need interactivity, movement. You often have situations in which a non-artist has the job of putting graphic elements into a corporate intranet site or a small business internet site. And many of the more complex graphics you could create in Photoshop just wouldn't work on the web. The solution to all of that is a terrific new product called NetStudio 1.0. The software sort of combines the power of a program like Photoshop 
with the ease of use of a point-and-click presentation program like PowerPoint. It's really amazing how easily you can create professional-looking ad banners and other graphic web elements. The program is described by the developers as a picture processor because it has the same easy-to-use interface and commands as a traditional word processor. Also, NetStudio lets you easily move your graphics into website creation programs like FrontPage or Netscape's Composer or Adobe's PageMill. You can download a free beta copy demo from the NetStudio website. The full package sells for under $150. That's it for this edition of The Chronicles. We'll be back here again next week with the latest in computer hardware, software, and the Internet. Thanks for joining us. I hope we'll see you here next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by Cybersmith, Wired for Fun and Learning, with locations in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Palo Alto, California, and White Plains, New York. And by TechWeb, for up-to-the-minute technology news. To purchase a videotaped copy of today's program, call toll-free 1-888-310-7850. Please specify the show number and the topic. Next week on the Computer Chronicles, Software Secrets. We'll show you some of the hidden power inside Word and Excel. Adobe Photoshop is a deep program. You'll see some new tools you didn't know existed. Sometimes the source of Software Secrets is the old helpline. We'll show you some folks who earn their living revealing Software Secrets. You know what an Easter egg is? It is a software surprise. We'll show you some of the best ones, plus the hidden secrets in computer games, some sneaky ways to get to the next level. It's all coming up next week on the Computer Chronicles.